Tom Rennie, then we spoke to Tom a little bit earlier today, and the first thing that he was talking about was, you know, in London, if you've been in London, you ride the tube, of course. That's what you say, the most convenient way to get around. Well, he said, no, 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 Tubey not working. So man has to catch Bussy Wussy home. Tom, nightmare. Yeah. Well, I live on the Elizabeth line, which is the new line they opened from, from east to west about uh, three, four months ago. It was seven years late, a billion over budget, and it's closed every weekend. <laughs> I was going to say this is music to my ears because this is this is New Zealand. I mean, what I'm what I'm hearing there's another New Zealand on the other side of the world where they couldn't put an egg on a piece of toast. If I handed the the, the bread out of the freezer and cracked the egg for them, they couldn't get it organised here. This is wonderful to hear, Tom. Yeah, politicians are all rubbish. There was no way of knowing. All right, then, let's talk about an action-packed weekend. And fascinating, again, might as well start at the top of the table because Man City dropping points after beating Arsenal away. I think most of us just sat there and thought, OK, well, the title race is over, it's theirs. What does this tell us, though? Is it going to be like this till the end of the season? Yeah, I think it is because the great thing about the title race this year is, A, that we've got one, but B... It's not like the Liverpool Man City ones of a couple of years ago where the teams were so flawless. They were so flawless and so impressive and so varied in the way they won games that, you know, it almost became a bit boring because they kept on winning and winning and winning and winning and winning and 98 points and 99 points and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Whereas this time around, you know, what makes great champions, what makes great entertainment, what makes great drama is flaws. And they have flaws. Uh, the three teams that I think are in the title race right now all have flaws. Arsenal are flawed because the the depth of the squad isn't quite there, but the quality certainly is. Uh, Man City are flawed because they just have these off days, days, these really, really weird off days. And against Nottingham Forest, they had lots of shots in the first half, but then just couldn't find a way to score goals. It took that amazing effort from Bernardo Silva for them to take the lead in the game. And apart from that, Nottingham Forest just hung in there, hung in there, hung in there. And your boy Chris Wood nicked the equaliser as the game went on. So, really interesting. I think it will go right down to the wire. It might be an 85-point champion and not a 95 to 100-point title. And, and that'll be good for all of us, I think. Well, and then you look at uh, Southampton, who are just absolutely hopeless. And I know they don't have a new manager, but they sacked one. And that managerial bounce-back thing happened again. They go to Chelsea, really similar game. Like, I mean, Chelsea did everything except score. And they didn't, and they lost. I mean, explain that result. Uh, oh, you're asking me to explain Chinese handwriting and brain surgery there. I think that with Southampton, they have, they have a poor squad. They've got a poor squad, poorly envisaged over a long period of time by Ralph Hasenhutl, who with various ownership uh, groups in charge, couldn't quite find a way to build a coherent squad. They brought in Nathan Jones, who was just such a terrible appointment. He was like that guy who you invite to a wedding, and while he's there, he kisses the bride, beats up the groom, and throws the cake down the stairs. Like, he's a terrible, terrible man. And he was rightly sacked. And Ruben Sellers, who's come in for Southampton, he's been there all the time, and he came out in the pre-weekend press conference, and I love this. They said to him, do you think you'll be here a long time? And it wasn't like the bloke at Leeds or other caretaker managers. He went, I want to be manager. I'm not sure why I wasn't manager beforehand. I should be manager. I'm glad I'm manager. I'm staying manager. And if that's your attitude, and you go out and beat Chelsea, you're now the manager. He's got the job. I don't think Southampton will look any further for another boss. Um, they rode their luck. I mean, Chelsea should have won that 4-5-1 in truth. Raheem Sterling kept missing chances. Um, Graham Potter thought it was the kind of game where he could change four or five players from the Dortmund game, which was bizarre. Like, he was just able to rotate like it was a nothing game. It was a really weird way of going about it for Graham Potter, who, under any other ownership model at Chelsea, would have been sacked about six games ago. I'm not sure they're having him, and I don't think he's having many of them. But Southampton won the game because they got James Ward Prowse. And I know you love David Beckham. James Ward Prowse is better than David Beckham at taking free kicks and scoring them. Not in terms of technical ability, maybe, but in terms of the conversion rates, he just doesn't have that many chances to score direct free kicks. He only has one per game or one every other game. They just fly in. Only David Beckham has scored more, but Beckham used to get two or three a game. He was playing for a, a brilliant team. He, James Ward prowse is playing with some real nonsense players, Jan Bednarek et al., and yet he's scoring great free kicks, and he may well keep them up if they just keep getting fouls on the edge of the area. That's what I'd be saying if I was Ruben Sellers. Just go down. One in five you'll get. 
and one in one he will score and that'll keep us up bend it like Ward. no whack it like ward prowse yeah i mean oh, I, nice. I was just yes, i was nice. i was i was i was i was i was watching their highlights yesterday and i saw that and that's why i messaged you about it and, I, and he like he's one behind in terms of you know i didn't even know they kept stats for this but tom you know where this is the beautiful thing about these guys you know where he's going to hit it there's only one place he can hit it what's the goalkeeper meant to do is yeah he, you know is he meant like he's not really going to go the other corner is he because that technique is a completely different technique his technique is to kind of turn almost sideways to the goal and kind of flick it with that inside of the foot like they do these days like marcus rashford does that, that kind of technique as well it's a brand i think you know Cristiano, you know introduced that to the to the to the to the premier league but it's like, you know, mm. you know, it's like, you know, it's like facing, you know, the guy who's got the googly. You know it's coming. You know where it is. All you've got to do yes. is do something to stop it, but you can't. Well, I think he's got a lot of variety in his free kicks. The one in the weekend is a similar one to the, to the ones he scored previously. But if you go back through some of these free kicks he scored, there was one against Wolverhampton Wanderers last year. He's 40 plus yards out and he swirls it left and right towards goal. He can take them low, he can take them high, he can take them hard, he can take them soft, he can chip them in, he can spin them in, he can swaz them in, as Glenn Hoddle would put it. Um, look, he's just tremendous at it. And I, I take your point completely. You know what he's going to do, but this is the same as, you know, fighting Mike Tyson or trying to win the boat race. You know exactly how Oxford and Cambridge are going to do the boat race. They keep pulling their oars as hard as possible until someone gets over the line. But that doesn't mean you know how to beat them or you know how to stop them. And he's just so gifted at doing it, so technically brilliant at doing it, and all the research in the world and all the planning. If you give a free kick away, and chances are you are going to give a free kick away, you're in massive, massive trouble if James Will Prowse is on the field. And at the moment, there's nothing anybody can do about it. Great analogy there. Mike Tyson always said, everyone's got a plan to like punch them in the mouth, okay? So yeah, Ward Prowse, everyone's got a plan to like fishing it out the back <laughs> of the net. Tom Rennie, our talk sport with us. We're going to talk relegation battle and also... More top of the table, but that top four race in itself is, you know, fascinating, and it's and it's and it's another aspect. You know, Tom, so many, so many, you know, reasons to despise this top four thing for the Champions League because, <laughs> you know, because you know, you know, United have got a cup final coming this weekend, and I'm sitting there going, I'd rather take three points against Leicester and lose to Newcastle if I had to choose. You know, but, you know, the FA Cup was a wonderful competition, and I used to love the Cup Winners' Cup. I thought that was a brilliant European trophy. The Europa League mm. is just a fizz; it's a fizzle compared to what the Cup Winners' Cup was. But that's you know, kind of irrelevant these days because everyone wants top four. So in the top four race, Tottenham go ahead and. Newcastle, how significant is that? Liverpool are right up the backside with a couple of games in hand and they're playing well all of a sudden. I think we can write Chelsea off, but I think it's United, Tottenham, Newcastle, Liverpool for those two spots. Yeah, look, I would actually discount Man United from that conversation. I think that they are far and away the third best team in the country. And, and as we speak, I think they're in a title race, being just five points behind an Arsenal team and a Man City team who are, who are, who are flawed at the moment. They might go on a run, but don't show any signs of doing so. So I think Man United will make it. The other slot is really interesting. I'm just coming from the Tottenham game against West Ham, where but Tottenham didn't do very much. It's, it's, it's fascinating. I've done so many Tottenham games this season as, as commentator or, or been to see them, and they never seem to play well. They never seem to do anything particularly well. They never dominate a game. They never create that many chances. They're not thrilling to watch. Did they win? Yeah. And over and over again, that's happened this season. I went to see them against Fulham a couple of weeks ago where nothing happened. The game was so dull and drab. Did they win? Yeah. 1-0. Harry Kane. And today against West Ham, you know, West Ham are a feeble side at this moment in time, which we'll get to. Um, but, but Tottenham... They just have a moment of incision around the hour mark every week, then shut it down again. And that ruthless efficiency, um, as Monty Python might put it, I think that might get them there. And you look at the other teams in the mix with, with Newcastle, I think that they have gone so hard and so far so soon. I think you saw against Liverpool this weekend and in recent games against Bournemouth and West Ham, they're fizzling out. You don't really qualify for the Champions League with Joe Willock, Jacob Murphy and Elliot Anderson in your team, which shows what a great job that that Eddie Howe has sort of done to this point, I think. So I think they will probably miss out, though European qualification next year, Europa League Conference League, would be terrific. And the amazing thing about it is right now, for that fourth spot, I wouldn't discount Fulham. I, I wouldn't discount them because they just keep winning games. And in the end, that is what matters. I think it's likely they'll get Conference League or Europa League qualification, which again, like Newcastle, will be a great achievement. But they're so hard to beat. They've, they've beaten Chelsea in recent times. They've beaten big teams, beaten small teams. They've got a goal scorer. Defence incredibly strong. 
a great vibe around Fulham at this moment in time. And to go to Brighton and win the weekend was a terrific result for them. So they're in that mix. I wouldn't discount Liverpool as well because, you know, they've flattered to deceive all season. I think they're probably, of all the teams I've listed, the only real threat to Tottenham in fourth when we get 15 games down the line at the end of the season. But huge race, great, important race for all these teams. And I hope Fulham do it personally. Then I hope Newcastle do it. Uh, and beyond that, you know, Liverpool scrape into the Champions League, you know, big whoop. Congratulations to them, but I won't celebrate. All right, relegation battle then. And you've been through a few of these um, and you've escaped a couple of times. You've had the heartbreak of relegation. Again, what is your gut feeling about this year? Your squad is too good to go down, but I've said that before about teams. And here you are again in the bottom three, West Ham. Well, well, look, West Ham have now lost 13 games this season. They only lost, I think, 14 in the entirety of last season. Just five victories. Wins are what get you up. And West Ham have got two since October. You know, I think David Moyes, I said to this to you before, he's delivered two of the best seasons in the last maybe 25 years at West Ham United. But this year, back end of last season, through the entirety of this season to this point, the writing's beyond the wall. They just do not know how to score a goal. And in the end, it's wins that keep you up. I keep saying this. That's what keeps you up. And they don't look like they know how to score. They don't look like they know how to win. You know, Sean Dyche famously said when Burnley manager, when they went to Everton and Everton took a 1-0 lead, he said to his players, this lot don't know how to win a game, lads. And, and that's the issue with West Ham. They do not know how to win a game. Do they have the best squad in the bottom half? Yes, they do. Do they have the most experienced manager in the bottom half? Yes, they do. The biggest stadium, everything. Yes, yes, yes. It's all there. But they can't find the right formula. And, and I've got to say, the performance against Tottenham, uh, you know, with the caveat of oh, they've had Chelsea recently, Newcastle recently, and all that sort of stuff. You know, not the best fixtures. It was pitiful. This is West Ham supporters' biggest game of the season. It's their cup final. It's their the, the nearest biggest local rivals. The game they want to win more than anything else. And they had one shot on target after going one nil down. Tottenham were there to get beaten, and West Ham couldn't work out how to do it. I think another manager would have turned it around. But I, th- I think we're past that point. The move was Sean Dyche four weeks ago. They didn't make that move. They think David Moyes can keep them up. I still think he can. I still think it's more likely than not. But it's going to be close because no one saw Bournemouth winning at Wolverhampton Wanderers. They played with bravery and won. Certainly no one saw Southampton beating Chelsea, which we discussed, but they played with bravery and won. And in the end, Mark, you know, a bit of everyday casual sexism here, but sometimes you've got to show the balls to win. That's what you need. You need to get out there and say, we want to win this game. Show some intestinal fortitude. And right now, West Ham are wimps. The manager is afraid. The players are bottling it. And bottle jobs don't stay up. Simple as that.